and welcome to the Wine Enthusiast Podcast, your serving of drinks culture and the people who drive it. I'm JC Tops. This episode is a special addition to our regular lineup. Wine fraud may sound like a seductive plot on Law & Order or a Sunday Lifetime movie, but it's very real. And this week, we're taking a look at the organized crime. Writer-at-large Christina Picard sat down with Maureen Downey to discuss the latest on one of the largest wine fraud cases in modern history. Maureen is a former auction house employee and founder of Chai Consulting, a company specializing in wine authentication and valuation. Maureen has inspected hundreds of millions of dollars worth of wine in the course of advising the world's top collectors, auction houses, and wine merchants. So listen on as Maureen explains how Rudy Curran Juan pulled off one of the most expensive wine scams in our time, explains the fine wine scene in Singapore where Rudy currently resides, and what his fraudulent actions have done to the wine industry as a whole. The Calling is a dream collection of California wines offering a distinct range of varietal styles in -in best-in-class appellations. Winemaker James McFowl gives each wine a clear, singular voice, working with renowned family growers to craft Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet Sauvignon while collecting over 70, 90-plus scores in the process. Join one of the Callings fully customizable wine clubs for first access to new releases, special library vintages, and more. With four membership options, there's a club for every wine lover. Receive three shipments per year or try monthly subscriptions delivering three bottles a month straight to your door. For more information and access, visit us at thecallingwine.com backslash enthusiast. Hi, my name is Christina Picard, one of Wine Enthusiast's Writers at Large. Today, we're bringing you some very recent updates on the whereabouts and actions of Rudy Kurniawan, who was convicted in 2013 of one of the largest, most elaborate wine frauds in history. Rudy was released from prison in 2021 and immediately deported from the U.S. to Indonesia. Today, I'll be talking to Maureen Downey, a former auction house employee and the founder of the wine collector services firm Shea Consulting, the authentication resource website winefraud.com, and her new anti-fraud and track and trace Web3 venture Shea Vault. Maureen is one of the world's few wine authentication experts and was the earliest whistleblower of Rudy's scam back in 2002. She has followed his case closely for over two decades and is just back from Singapore, where Rudy now resides part-time, and where he is, apparently, back in the wine fraud game. Maureen, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. A pleasure. So before we launch into where Rudy is now, to give listeners a reminder of the Rudy Kurniawan case, this is a man who is Indonesian born and raised, was living illegally in the United States from 2003, and as it was eventually discovered, is from a family of convicted criminals and fraudsters back home in Indonesia. In the United States, Kurniawan was convicted in 2013 of counterfeiting wines that the FBI estimated he sold for about $30 million, as well as bank fraud for a $7 million loan that he obtained with false information. It's estimated that he actually made more like $550 million worth of fake wine, and it's speculated that an approximate 10,000 bottles are still in circulation or in the private sellers of collectors. Kurniawan was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but was released in June of 2021 after serving eight and a half years and was then deported straight afterwards from the U.S. Do I have all that right so far? Uh, Yeah, pretty much. He's actually a Chinese national, but he grew up in Indonesia. Gotcha. So his family is is Chinese. And that that was somehow important in in the case. It was part of his defense because it was you know, woe is him. He didn't fit in. He was the poor Chinese kid in Indonesia. So whatever. Gotcha. It's also why his parents gave him the name Rudy Kurniawan, uh, because that's an Indonesian name. It's actually a famous Indonesian badminton player. Oh, really? Yeah. His real name is Jin Wang Wong. Gotcha. 
So for listeners who want to hear more about how Maureen, how you got to know Rudy and and your whole journey with with him, I would recommend listening to our sister podcast, Vinfamous, where you do go more into detail on that about your history with him and and his his story leading up till now. For this episode, I want to talk about where Rudy is now. And also, before I forget, I also want to recommend folks go to your winefraud.com site because you have in-depth reports on his case, both the trials, uh, where he is now. So I also recommend your winefraud.com site. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But let's fast forward to the present day, which at the time of recording, it's November 1st, 2023. Uh, The internet was awash with speculations just before Kurniawan's prison release in 2021 over where he would end up being deported to. Would he head to Europe, would Hong Kong, Singapore? It turns out it was the latter. So Kurniawan is now living at least part-time in Singapore. Can you describe for us firstly what the wine scene is like in Singapore, particularly within the collecting and fine wine world? Yeah, you know, it's actually a really interesting time for Singapore. So prior to 2008, when Hong Kong completely dropped their tariff on wine. Um, Singapore was like the fine wine hub of Asia. That's where all the fine wine was was imported to. It's a good kind of cross-section area. It's easy to reach from most places. It's beautiful. So it used to be the fine wine hub. And then when Hong Kong brought their tariff down, Hong Kong quickly took over as the fine wine hub. But as China has taken back over Hong Kong, and especially with, you know, the draconian lockdowns during COVID and, you know, the Chinese murdering all the pets and shit like that. I mean, that happened in Hong Kong mm-hmm. as well. So most of the expats have left. There have been about 130,000 British people that have left and all the French people that worked in wine that I knew that lived there left. So Wow. What what is what is interesting for Singapore about that is that Singapore is once again kind of become the the hotspot playground. Now that doesn't mean that Hong Kong is dead. The the tariff is still you know nothing in Hong Kong, so it's still a, a, a big hub. But Singapore has regained a little bit of its position as as the place to go, and the fine wine scene there is hot. It's it's really fun. That's an interesting update. Thank you. I didn't realize a lot of that. So speaking of, and you're able to speak with experience because you have literally just returned from a trip to Singapore, can you tell us what you uncovered there in terms of Rudy Kurniawan? So what's funny is that even unsolicited, like totally unsolicited, ever since Rudy got out, everybody's been sending me like pictures like, oh, we spotted him here. We spotted him there. So I've had a little bit of a, of a, of knowledge about where, you know, about his movements and stuff. And I just think that's funny because I never asked for it, you know, Uh, but now that people are sending it to me, I think it's super interesting. So now I want people to keep sending me stuff. But so Rudy is living at least part time. So he, he was deported to Indonesia. He's got family in Indonesia, but he probably also has most certainly has um, at least a family domicile in Singapore. So it looks like he's spending most of his time in Singapore, but he is going back and forth to Hong Kong quite a bit. And it's funny because when I was there, so you're right, it's today is Wednesday. I got back on Monday night um, at 10 o'clock. So I'm literally just back. I'm still jet lagged. But apparently over the weekend, Rudy was spotted and somebody took a picture of him in immigration at Hong in Hong Kong. And I think this is amazing. So We've got pictures of him tasting wine and drinking wine. And and apparently the the deal is that his services are for sale and everybody knows it. And he'll make he'll make wine and, and people are paying him to attend lunches and dinners. But he was going to Hong Kong. This pisses me off because YPO, which is a legitimate organization, was paying him to go to Hong Kong to speak to their organization. Wow. What yeah. could you clarify what YPO actually is? What kind of organization? Young Presidents Organization. It's a really respected, you know, organization. We are the global leadership community of the extraordinary chief executives. More than 30,000 members from 142 countries. That's Young Presidents Organization. That is the tagline if I look it up on the website. 
And then here it says YPO or YPO.org. YPO is an American-based worldwide leadership community of chief executives with more than 34,000 global members in more than 142 countries. So and they're paying him to yes. present at an event of theirs. Could you speculate on what they could, what he could be speaking about? Counterfeit wine. I, I don't know. I mean, how to rip off their friends. I don't know. I, I, I just think that's, I mean, I get it if a group of collectors are like, yeah, let's get that Rudy guy. So what a lot of times what they're doing is, and at least the, the data that I've been given um, and, and then all the stories that I've been told is, is there's one group where the organizer will have his friends pull out like really big bottles, like 1990 Romane Conti, like $30,000 bottle, you know, 1990 Le Pin, 1990 Petrus, like crazy bottles that most people in the world will never get to drink. And the organizer will tell Rudy what the people who are coming to the dinner are bringing and then Rudy will make his own version of those bottles and they go and, um, and they have an event and they do, they taste the wine side by side blind. And everybody talks about, you know, which wine they like better. And um, of the tasting notes that I've read and the tasting notes that we have on winefraud.com, uh, we obtained a, somebody sent me um, a WeChat document with tasting notes and photographs from one of these events. Um, and of course, it's the same thing that people used to say. They like Rudy's wine better because it tastes fresher. And that's because he's using younger wine. So why he's why 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 an organization like YPO would pay, you know, a convicted felon who still owes he made a lot more than $30 million. He owes over, you know, he owes $30 million to his, his victims in restitution. And this organization is paying him to go and speak. And this goes back, I think, to this perception where some people see him as this Robin Hood figure, where others as the convicted criminal that he is. What There's do you think Robin Hood comes about from? There, wait, wait. There is nothing Robin Hood about Rudy. You know, you cannot say, and, and well, maybe there is because Robin Hood, if you look at the truth of the Robin Hood story, he wasn't stealing from the rich to give to the poor. Robin Hood was taking back the people's taxes that the king had stolen from them. Rudy did nothing positive at all, ever, except for John Capon and Acromero Condit and a bunch of those guys that made a boatload of money off of Rudy's fraud. Rudy damaged the wine industry. He damaged producers. He damaged the supply chain. You know, he forever damaged the, the, the wine consumers trust in the wine industry. And he caused prices to rise significantly. So there is no positive about what Rudy did. The reason that people want to hang out with him is not because he's a Robin Hood figure. It's because he's a gangster. Mm. And people like to hang out with gangsters. And I mean, now that you know that people are paying to hang out with this gangster uh, mm. for Kurnia One to create these fake wines for him, as someone like yourself who's devoted her life to catching wine fraudsters, how do you feel about this? You know, I'm pissed off. I, I got to be honest. Um, it's really brazen. Like, I always wondered if he was going to get back into it. What I find really interesting, and this is one of the things that I wrote on winefraud.com, is that people over the last, you know, in, in the years that he was, uh, so he was in jail for about a year and a half before he was he was sentenced. So in the time that he was in jail, people were always asking me, what do you think he's going to do? Is he going to get back into it? And I always thought, well, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, his family is involved in enough other stuff that he could stay out of it, but the one thing that always gave me pause was that in his letter to the judge, which was supposed to be a contrition letter, which is also posted on winefraud.com, he didn't apologize. He didn't say, I'm really sorry I ripped people off. What he said was, this was the only thing I was ever good at. And I find that to be a fascinating statement. There was no contrition in, the, in, in that letter. You know, it was, 
be kind to me because I have to take care of my mother who's, who's, you know, old. And this is the only thing I was ever good at. Like, that's not very, I'm sorry. Right. So, um, it makes sense to me that he got back into it. It, it makes sense to me that he's, you know, he's got this, like, he's kind of, he's infamous and, and people want to do that. And he's good at it. He's good at making these blends. So what pisses me off is that there are so many people in the world who have been his victims because whether or not you purchased Rudy Kurniawan's wine at auction or direct or through a retail offering, if you are part of the wine, fine wine, loving community, you are a victim of his fraud. So it just makes no sense to me that he's being celebrated the way that he is. And let's be clear, Kurnia, what Kurniawan is doing Kurniawan is doing now at these parties is legal. I mean, anyone could blend together a cheap wine and say, yeah, let's blend this against the real deal, see which is which which is fine if they're just for party games. But what if these fake wines find their way into the market? Um, what are your speculations on that? Right. He's also taking the empties home. He takes the real bottles empty, you know, empty home, which is what he used to do. And the right. real question is, and, and there is, so there's some of the things that I've heard is that he has actually been approached by wineries to be a consultant. And those wineries would have to be in China. Because if they're in the U.S., then any money that he makes needs to pay restitution. Like, remember, he hasn't paid his victims back a penny. So, to my knowledge, or if he has, it's been negligible, you know? So, yeah, I mean, anybody can make a counterfeit wine and say, ha-ha, fun party trick. Uh, the problem is if, if he actually starts to get hired to make a counterfeit production. And what we've seen in the wake of the the Kurnia one and the there was a famous counterfeiter before Rudy an infamous counterfeiter before Rudy named Hardy Rodenstock and they both made old and rare bottles which is difficult because you have to age the wine and everything in the wake of of that fraud what what happened globally organized crime looked at this and said well you know damn only one person has ever really been convicted of this there was one guy Alexander Ayugov who got caught in in making counterfeit Domaine de la Romane Conti. And he got, you know, a couple days in jail and 150,000 euro fine. If you're familiar with Romane Conti, I mean, the 2020 vintage was just released on a list price of $8,500 a bottle. And it's already flipping on the market for 28,000. So 150,000 euros isn't really, you know, a big hit. So organized crime has looked at this and realized that they can, they can make big money. And so they're they're getting professional and they're using professional printers and having the exact glass made and using professional bottling lines. And as long as the uh, the supply chain remains as opaque as it is, because the supply chain in the wine world and spirits world is of the most opaque in the world. Hmm. Producers aren't really going to know that their their bottles have been counterfeited and are flooding into markets, especially, you know, little markets all around Asia or, you know, in other, in other countries that aren't heavily looked at for fine wine. And now a word from our sponsor. Where can you find the best gifts at the lowest prices that everyone will love? At Total Wine & More, of course. With so many great bottles to choose from, find something for everyone on your list whether it's a Cabernet for your sister, a sparkling wine for a coworker, or a single barrel bourbon for your dad. And if you need any help, just ask one of our friendly guides for advice. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, you'll always find what you love and love what you find at Total Wine & More. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly, B21.
Going back to Kurniawan, many believe that he wasn't acting alone in this massive fraud that he committed in the U.S. At the very least, others, as you've touched upon, many others great, uh, greatly profited off the back of his scam. Do you think any of these profiteers or collaborators could feel a sense of indebtedness to, Ru- to Rudy for sort of taking one for the team? And if so, could they be helping him f- to continue to commit the same crimes in Indonesia? Or do you spec- suspect Rudy is flying solo over there? So there, he's not flying solo, I'm 100% not flying solo. He is being supported by a, a network of, of people. Um, part of that is family. Part of that is other, other people. He 100% took one for the team. Because these guys didn't, nobody in a million years thought that Rudy was going to get 10 years sentence. You know, they thought that he was going to get 18 months, time served. Slap on the wrist. So he a thousand percent took one for the team. You know, I mean, people, if you look at, and again, I've got this on Wine Fraud, all the evidence that was from the trial and everything is on winefraud.com. Um, I got it all. We went in, we cataloged everything. Um, we even looked at his bank records and, and stuff like that. But if you look at the post sale report from the seller and the seller too, which for a long time remained the largest, um, you know, single seller auction in history, like $34 million. If you look at the, the post sale report on that, and you look at the last couple pages, you'll notice all of the loans that Rudy got. People were loaning Rudy a million dollars at a time. Individuals, people who were clients of, of Acker through Acker Merrill Condit. And these are people that would then buy wine at auction. So what is that? I mean, that's absolutely creating a fraud. They were paying Rudy to make these wines. Because why would you Why would you loan a guy a million dollars through a wine auction house and then buy wine at the auction and pay the 30% markup? Why not just give Rudy a million dollars and get a million dollars worth of wine? Hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Totally weird. So there were a lot of different types of support. The, the emails, you know, especially the emails about the catalog introductions that, that have been made public between John Capon and Rudy and Eric Greenberg make it totally undeniable that Capon knew that these were counterfeit ones. You know, I mean, Rudy wrote emails saying like, well, the goal here is to market to people who don't know Acker. Because Acker had a reputation for selling counterfeits. Which just to clarify for those who don't know, it was, was the auction house, correct? Right. Is, is one of the, is the main auction house that Rudy used. Right. So yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people who were complicit in this crime, who helped, who facilitated, um, who chose to look the other way at minimum. And, and, and there are a lot of people, because I, I worked in these auctions in New York, right? I mean, Rudy and myself and John Capon, we were all friends. I started in auctions in 2000 and, you know, we were all about the same age. Rudy's a little bit younger, a couple years younger than John and I, but, you know, we would all go to tastings and have dinners and, you know, it was all jolly good fun. And I know that they knew better because I knew better. And suddenly I left New York and these guys just started, you know, a lot of the people that I knew, like Robert Bohr, who I know knew better, decided to be part of the shit show party because it was fun. So these guys all just got wrapped up in the, you know, big lumber, big bottles, but they knew better. And you knew for a long time before he got, who was actually convicted years, correct? Yeah. And so did, so did a lot of people in the industry, you know? And and so here's the thing. You cannot be both an expert and an ignoramus. Hmm. So pick your path. Either you are complicit or you're an idiot. And I know that a lot of these guys were complicit because I know that they knew because we talked about it. Do you think Kurniawan's conviction has had an impact on the growing global counterfeit wine problem? Has it helped to curb any counterfeiting? Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. It's absolutely caused more counterfeiting. Because again, when when you're organized crime and you look at this and you see, okay, one guy in America got, you know, a 10 year sentence. He served eight and a half for literally counterfeiting hundreds of millions of dollars and changing an industry, you know, in the wake of, of the Kurniawan fraud, wine prices went up 
you know, exponentially because these guys were trading wines that didn't exist anymore. Right. Well, the, the, the producers saw that and said, well, wait a minute, why are we getting such a small tranche of this? So, you know, the whole on premier Bordeaux thing changed people. Now Bordeaux producers now hold back a lot more of their own um, supply you know, many producers globally are, are looking to sell more direct to consumer so that they can hold some of these prices. I mean, prices have gone up massively. A rising tide rises all boats. So, you know, the, the price of a Napa Valley cab has gone from 75 bucks to what, an average of like 250. And we do have a bit of Rudy to thank for that. The other thing that changed is the fact that all producers of fine wine decided they needed to do something about anti-fraud, but they all went cosmetic. So they all, the, a lot of them changed from digital, from, excuse me, from plate press printing to digital printing to add micro writing and invisible ink. All of that is very easily counterfeited by, oh, completely. I mean, you just buy a professional printer. And, you know, so a professional printer is about $550,000. If you're organized crime making DRC, that's not a huge investment. So it's no longer, you know, the fear is no longer guys like Rudy in their kitchen making wine. It's now, you know, I mean, Google, Google, go on YouTube and Google, you know, counterfeit wine production in China. And you'll see professional bottling lines of Bordeaux bottles or the Sasakaya fraud. You know, and a lot of these frauds are only found because the supply in particular markets is way greater than the alleged distribution. And are there counterfeiting hotspots? Like, are there places that are making and selling fraudulent wines where there is particularly rampant in certain countries and regions? There are absolutely counterfeit hotspots. And um, I think it's important to kind of separate um, some of those out a little bit. So we've got Clearly, there's a lot of counterfeit wine being made in China, and there are different types of counterfeit wine there. We've got um, IP infringement, you know, which is a type of, of counterfeiting that is really big. And that's, you know, the making of pen foids versus pen folds type mm. thing. Uh, but that's not the kind of fraud that I'm, I'm, I'm really focused on. Clearly, China has a large production, but in terms of fine and rare wine, we're looking at Northern Italy, Bulgaria, France itself, Switzerland. So I think Switzerland is more the sale venue rather than the production zone. But the other thing that that's that's often found, and this is more for spirits, but conflict zones are big. Syria, uh, Northern Ireland. Well, it, it's a it's a pretty fast way for organized crime and terrorist groups to raise money. And the thing is, so going back to an earlier question that, that you asked, and I didn't fully answer it. If, if you're an organized crime and you look at this and you realize that you can make counterfeit wines or spirits and make a massive amount of money. And if you get caught, maybe you get a slap on the wrist. Maybe you get a 150,000 euro fine. Well, that's good business. You know, it's easier than trafficking drugs all over the world. It's easier than trafficking people. And if you get caught, you, ba you barely get a slap on the wrist, right? So unfortunately, what we've seen in the wake of Rudy is that the game has shifted and it's not so much, again, the guy in the kitchen. It's much more of an organized crime, big group. That's really interesting and terrifying. <laughs> uh, from your perspective, what are the latest tracing technologies you use in your authentication work? So I know there's blockchain technology. There is a new company in New Zealand using forensic science to test the exact origins of the wine inside the bottle. Have we come a long way with these technologies or not? Is technology staying ahead of these fraudsters or behind it? So I'm going to separate that out into a couple things. So first of all, the technologies that we use to authenticate wine that we use. So I have been training authenticators for several years. We've got certified authenticators all over the globe. We've got a bunch of people in training. We're looking for more. But so our network and, and using my methodologies, we don't use any of those technologies. And to be honest, you know, for years, people have been trying to find a solution about, about the liquid. And there's not much that you can tell from the liquid unless you have a sample. And if you have a sample, what are you going to do when you have a bottle? You're going to you're going to send a sample of every one of your bottles in to get tested before you open it up. Like that's just silly, right? 
one of the biggest problems with with testing the liquid is that you you know people are like oh we can find the dna of the vineyard well what if they did three different blends and they released them at different times of the same wine you know there are just so many problems with that and the biggest problem is having the database of authentic examples against which you would test that wine but again who's going to do that in in what instance is it logical that i'm going to have my wine tested to make sure that it's the same thing. It makes sense if you're a bulk wine producer, right? And you 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 go and you t- sample and you buy wine. You want to make sure that what you're getting is actually what you bought because there you are going to still be doing testing to make sure that everything is sound and safe and healthy. But, you know, for a bottle of wine, nobody's going to do that. So that's out. That's silly. You know, and mass spectrometry where you, you, you know, put a laser through the bottle. Again, it's just not economically feasible and it's not user-friendly enough. In the wake of the Kurniawan fraud, uh, producers all went cosmetic. And the problem with cosmetic or even having like a chip on the back of the label or QR codes, all of these things have several flaws. The first of which is you have to be, and 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 the bubble tags, you know, that that don't cover the top. All of those things substantiate counterfeit refills. And we've seen a huge problem with counterfeit refills. I mean, a couple of years ago, there was a, a huge fraud in Europe where there was a very organized group of people that were collecting bottles from hotels and restaurants and refilling them and selling them online and in online auctions in the US and Europe. Like hundreds of that or hundreds of thousands of bottles, but tens of millions of dollars. So that's not helpful, right? All the cosmetic stuff is for the most part, secretive. And if you know what to look for, great. And, or if there's a bubble tag, great. You have to have the bottle in your hand to, to, to verify that fine wine isn't purchased by going to the store and picking up one bottle. Most people buy fine and rare wine as futures, you know, in response to an email ad from a retailer, you know, they buy it from an online store, they buy it at auction they buy it from brokers. Nobody has the bottle in hand. And, you know, the only people that ever actually inspect the bottles are the auction houses. So because people think that counterfeit wine is an auction problem, it is not. It's a it's a general secondary market problem and sometimes a primary market problem. So none of those things are good. And, and the reason is that um, in order to be useful for to protect a producer and, and a brand and to protect a consumer is that there has to be transparency through the supply chain so that producers can know exactly where their bottles are going and how and how they're moving and if their allocations are being siphoned off to you know other markets um, where they're not supposed to go. And if you're the consumer, you need that proof of authenticity and provenance before you buy the bottle, right? So you need to be able to see some sort of proof online prior to purchase. So we've created a solution called the Shea Vault. Um, Shea is French for seller. So Shea Consulting, Shea Vault. And what, what this solution does is it's it's not only, it's Web3, so it's blockchain secured. It's not only proof of, of authenticity, but it shows the actual provenance of the bottle because every time the ownership changes, the online ledger of authenticity and provenance is updated. Throughout the supply chain, the producers can demand that wholesalers and distributors and retailers scan the bottles in, and they don't have to be scanned in one at a time. We use uh, actually library technology to be able to scan, you know, a pallet at a time. And then, you know, the, the a URL with an individual ledger of authenticity and provenance that is blockchain secured can be put online, whether that's on Wine Searcher or you know on a in, in an auction catalog like we did in, in 2019 with Zaki's auction. We sold three and a half million dollars. Every single bottle had a ledger of authenticity and provenance on it, and that's what people need. I mean, they need the information before they buy, because if you're close enough to scan a bottle, it's too late. And is it all fine and rare wines? Mostly the majority of fine and rare wines at a premium level being counterfeited. Absolutely not. So um, here's another fun Google. The UK is awash with counterfeit yellowtail. 
I'd heard that actually. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, if you think about it, you know, if somebody's counterfeiting money, they either make a whole lot of ones or a couple hundreds, right? Yeah. So, uh, and the, the, the yellowtail um, situation was a collaboration of Chinese and Eastern European based organized crime. Hmm. And it's been going on for years. That's the other thing is that the yellowtail thing isn't like a six month deal. Like this has been going on for years. So uh, wine is is counterfeited at every level. And one of the interesting things that we're seeing is that it, you know, traditionally, you know, traditionally for the lot for the for the Kurnia one and the, and the Rodenstock frauds, you know, they really did focus on old and rare and really expensive bottles and bottles that people didn't drink very often. So, you know, who are these guys to know what a Magnum of 1950 Lafleur tastes like? Everybody reads the tasting notes that a couple of critics wrote. And those critics actually wrote those tasting notes based on tastings that they did a lot of times with Hardy Rodenstock bottles. So it could be that the baseline is, is actually counterfeit, right? That's crazy. That is a, yeah, that is a sort of Twilight Zone-esque thought that <laughs> right? sends my brain spinning a bit. Totally. So, but I mean, who are these, if you were to take a case of 1945 Mouton and, and put all 12 bottles in the cellar and age them for, you know, 70 years, they're not going to taste exactly the same one to the next. Right. So unlike Yellowtail, where if you go to a bar and you have a glass of Yellowtail every night, think of it this way. If you drink Coca-Cola every day and somebody gives you a Pepsi, you're going to taste the difference, right? Mm -hmm. So I almost think that that person is easier to detect the fraud than somebody who thinks that they're drinking a 1945 Mouton. That's a right? really, really interesting point. Yeah. I mean, and Yellowtail sells for $8 retail I think, right. on the shelf, you know, right. so that's well, something and that absolutely that, someone could be drinking every day, you know. Well, Penfolds has had the biggest issue, you know, Penfolds and Carlo Rossi, you know, I think, which is a Gallo brand in China are just counterfeited on massive scales. Hmm. So, you know, the low end stuff um, gets hit just as much, but we're also seeing a lot of like $40 bottles getting hmm. counterfeited now. Like 40, Interesting. Yeah. $50 Brunello to Montalcino type stuff. Hmm. So it's, it's across the board. Yeah. Well, that's really, it's really fascinating. I'm going to have to wrap up. But I know, I feel like I could talk to you about this subject for hours. <laughs> it's so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I think the take home for collectors is to use your services or at least to, uh, to get some sort of authentication. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I would say like get bottles. Uh, if you're, if you're going to fork out big money to, to buy rare bottles, have them looked at by somebody prior to purchase, you know, like deal with it before it's a problem. And yeah, and the other takeaway is that Rudy is back in business. Well, yes, and that is that is certainly a big takeaway. Um, and I really appreciate you updating us on all of that and having been there on the ground, just giving us some uh, real invaluable insights into uh, into Kurniawan's, Rudy Kurniawan's movements as of late. And uh, we'll have to check back in with you at another point soon and see if you have any more developments on that front. Uh, right. but, uh, yeah, in the, in the meantime, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I've learned so much just in this, this past 40 minutes and I really appreciate your time and, uh, and, and thank you. Thanks for sharing your, your knowledge with us. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Counterfeiting wine is nothing new. Criminals have been doing it since the production of wine itself. And while it makes for good true crime stories and writ from the headlines movies, it ultimately harms the wine producers, critics, consumers, and the industry as a whole. What are your thoughts? If you liked today's episode, we'd love to read your reviews and hear what you think. You can email us your comments and questions at podcast at wineenthusiast.net. And hey, why not tell your wine-loving friends to check us out too? Remember, you could subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. You can also go to wineenthusiast.com backslash podcast for more episodes and transcripts. I'm JC Tops. Thanks for listening.